Good morning. I'm so glad you could be with me today in our study of God's Word together in the Unfolding the Word series. We're in the midst of a study of the book of Daniel, and we've begun examining chapter 6. Today I want to read our verses, and I want to begin in verse 3 and read through verse 5. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other presidents and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the presidents and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regards to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless, unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Well, as you remember now, chapter 5 ended with the end of the Babylonian Empire. <clears throat> chapter 5 was really about the final night in that empire, at a time when Belshazzar was the final king, 23 years after the death of Nebuchadnezzar, and we saw the foolish king the confrontation of that foolish king by God, the handwriting on the wall, and the destruction of Babylon. Well, Babylon's over. Just as God predicted, the Medo-Persian Empire has entered in to leadership, influencing the people of God, the Jewish people. Darius the Mede now rules the province of Babylon, which included the capital city of Babylon, former capital city, and the region surrounding it. Uh, Darius actually was one of a number of kings ruling different provinces under the broad superintendence of the emperor Cyrus. Now, yesterday we saw that Darius made the decision to put Daniel into new uh, top leadership structure. He broke the, the province into a place where there were three sub-administrators under him, with the satraps under them. Initially, one of three, Daniel's performance, as I read it to you in verse 3 today, was such that Darius quickly came to see, listen, Daniel's head and, head and shoulders above everybody else. I'm going to make him number one underneath me. The other two, the other two uh, rulers and guide, what they call presidents in the, in the ESV, will be under him reporting to him. The satraps will report to them. Well, Daniel, even at 80 plus years old, is showing the kind of uh, capabilities that marked him off at, as a young teenager in chapter 1 in Babylon. Like Babylon, however, those capabilities leading the existing ruler to promote him, or intend to promote him, uh, produced, I guess that's a better way to say it, Jealousy on the part of other rulers, other people with various levels of authority. And like in Babylon, now in the Medo-Persian Empire, the jealousy of such people led them to hate even more Daniel and to plot the downfall of Daniel. And so that's what we're looking at today as we see this plot begin to develop. The strategy that they had the, the other two administrators and the satraps under them was this. We will attack Daniel in a united front. We will attack Daniel in some clear-cut way that will discredit him in the eyes of Darius. So what we're going to do to do that is we're going to implement an investigative process. We're going to end up with, with special help and investigation, scrutinize every detail of his life, and we will find something that we can condemn him for. They wanted to scrutinize him like with a fine-tooth comb. And then whatever they find in that scrutinizing and investigation, then they will spin it into the worst possible light to discredit Daniel. Surprisingly contemporary, isn't it? Because if you're looking for the most contemporary strategy to assassinate characters, to push people out of positions. It is character assassination. 
finding something and then spinning it to make it look even worse than it is. That's certainly what's done in politics today. Doesn't matter the party, doesn't matter who's in charge. The goal is to find something to spin, to twist, to make the person discredited. That was the strategy. And so they went about accomplishing that. They investigated everything about his life, everything about his job performance. Would have taken them some time. But they looked at all of it. And what happens? No corruption could be uncovered in his behaviors or in his job performance. <laughs> what an amazing conclusion. And remember, the investigation was being done by his enemies. They weren't objective about it to start with. But even with that, they couldn't find anything. I get a uh, chuckle sometimes when I look at contemporary politics in the United States. Then you'll find Congress, particularly uh, the House of Representatives, but not solely there, deciding they're going to create an investigation into something. But the investigation always has to do with the opposition. And then they will investigate it controlling how the investigation unfolds. Anyone who is naive enough to accept the conclusions of such investigation deserves, I guess, the consequences of such of a half-truth and a policy uh, paradox that would emerge from such conclusions. Well, at any rate, we'll leave that for a moment. But isn't it amazing they could find nothing on Daniel? So they look at that, and in frustration, they say, well, we can't give up. we got to discredit Daniel, so what are we going to do? Let's revise our strategy. And again, these were the sharpest people. And so they said, our new strategy is we're not going to try to find something in his behavior, something in his job performance. We've not been successful anyway. Instead, we'll find something in his belief system. We will look at what it is he believes about God and what he believes God says to him to do, then that we will jump on. Only his faith will give us an opportunity to attack Daniel and to destroy him. And so they began a process of finding the conflict point between the law of God and God and the law of the land. Now I want to leave that for a moment because we're going to pick up on that tomorrow and look more carefully at what they discovered and what they did in response to it. But I want to pick up now, let's go back a verse, and say, isn't it amazing they could find nothing on Daniel? The greatest compliment I believe any believer could ever receive is when people investigate their life to have the phrase, no ground for complaint or fault, which is the phrase used here about Daniel. Even your enemies looking at it would find, quote, no ground for complaint or fault. Oh, Lord, may it be so. I was thinking the challenge that is given to us as disciples of Christ in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, picks up on this. Listen to these words. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak evil against you, or speak of you as an evildoer, which will happen, they may see your good deeds and then glorify God on the day of visitation. Now, you can't keep people from wanting to speak evil against you, but you can act in such a way honorably and faithfully that they will have to, at a certain point, recognize that you were not guilty of what they were hoping you'd be guilty of. I was thinking also in that same regard of Paul's claim as he appeared before the governor who was trying him in Acts chapter 24. In verses 13 to 16, listen to these words. As Paul's making his defense, he says, Neither can they prove to you what they're now bringing up against me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way, which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down in the law and written in the prophets. By the way, do you believe everything written in the law and in the prophets? I hope so. That's why we're unfolding the word together, because we believe that to be the case. Well, at any rate, believing everything laid down in the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So, listen to this. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward God 
and toward man. Daniel had a clear conscience before God and before man. They could not find anything that proved an accusation against him. I think ultimately, and we'll end with this, the perfect example of this is found in Jesus Christ as he appears before Pilate on that final night. And notice in Luke chapter 23, we read these words starting in verse 13. Pilate then called together all the chief priests and the rulers and the people, and he said to them, you brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. You know, you had made this accusation. After examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him, and neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. Here's the example of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. No matter how much he scrutinized, they do not find him guilty. Join me in the commitment of heart that we would be found in such a place because of our desire to live honorably, enabled by the Spirit of God, so that we live lives worthy of the gospel. Join me tomorrow as we continue to look at the plot against Daniel.